Thank you very much. Um, so reconciliation, Alaska Highway, museums, anniversaries, trucks, and transportation infrastructure. This is what I will be talking about for the next 30 or so minutes. This year, the Alaska Highway, or the ALCAN, short for Alaska Canadian Highway, is 80 years old. Some people call it the gravel magnet, as it pulled people off the land and into communities. Workers on the highway during its construction called it the oil can, as the sides of the road were strewn with fuel barrels. During this talk, I'll be exploring the Alaska Highway through some of the vehicles held in the Yukon Transportation Museum's collection. I'll give a tour over time of the Alaska Highway, its effects on the Yukon, and the complicated relationships that exist with it today. I really look forward to sharing with you some of my favorite Yukon stories and hopes for the future. What I hope you will keep in the forefront of your mind throughout this talk is the image of the tall tale postcards, of the story they tell of unlimited resources, and juxtapose that with everything you've ever heard about the Alaska Highway. Imagine most Alaska Highway lore as a version of tall tale postcards in that the truth is represented in a particular way. It is a particularly engaging way and that there are big parts left out in the popular renditions of the Alaska Highway story. I like to try and bring those out into the air. The Alaska Highway coming to being. This giant engineering and project management accomplishment has been called the most ambitious infrastructure project since the Panama Canal, and it is often described as starting and ending in 1942. The 1600 mile road from Dawson Creek, British Columbia to Delta, Delta Junction, Alaska, that was built in eight months. Though a captivating narrative, this is a tall tale. It took longer than that to create a functional road. And in fact, that work continues every year to this day and beyond. Plans for a route like the Alaska Highway had been proposed since the late 19th century. In the 1930s, the Premier of BC, Dufferin Duff Patello, was one of the people who were champion, championing the cause. He began his career in the Yukon, specifically Dawson City, before moving south and eventually he became the Premier of BC. He had a particular interest in annexing the Yukon to British Columbia. And the idea of an Alaska highway was a big part of his plan. The Yukon has not to date been annexed to BC, so his dream was left unrealized. He had lobbied for years within Canadian political circles and diplomatic meetings with American representatives, much to the Canadian government's displeasure. Because of this, he was politically sidelined in late 1941. Can you believe it? Only just before circumstances arose that created the instant feasibility of the Alaska Highway. Patello must have been outrageously frustrated as he watched the excitement and frenzy of its construction without being able to participate. The December 7th, 1941 bombing of Pearl Harbor not only brought the Americans into World War II with Roosevelt's day that will live in infamy speech, but also brought the North from the periphery to the front line. On February 6, 1942, the Alaska Highway Project was approved by the US Army. The Canadian government approved it shortly thereafter and construction began on March 9, 1942. It was not built from nothing. Initially, Grant McConaughey of United Air Transport and other Northern Bush plane operations had been building a network of airstrips and these were developed for the Northwest staging route. Before the start of building the Alaska Highway, thousands of aircraft were already being shuttled to our, at the time, ally, the Soviets, to defend against the Nazi German invasion. This was through the Lend-Lease program. My late friend, Doug Bell, worked on the Northwest staging route as a telegraph operator, or as he called it, the Sky Road. This Lend-Lease was paid back in part through the labors of a little British automotive company, Austin, and I will share more about them later. Many Austins ended up in the Yukon after World War II. More than 11,000 soldiers in every level of road construction. There were seven regiments of US Army engineers, three black and four white. 
16,000 civilian contractors, 7,000 pieces of military equipment, including 5,000 trucks worked on the highway. I wanna introduce you to four of these 5,000 trucks that worked on the Alaska Highway and are in the collection of the Yukon Transportation Museum. Despite paint weathering, the characteristic white star identifying this as a United States Army vehicle is still visible on the door of this 1942 Chev 4x4 dump truck. This was used by the US Army on the Canal Road, short for Canadian oil, which was a pipeline system built to provide fuel for the Alaska Highway and the Northwest staging route. According to accounts of the Engineering Corps that built the Alaska Highway and the Canal, the trucks were temperamental in the Yukon climate. The equipment was not designed for sub-zero weather and the trucks had to be kept running 24 hours a day. In fact, often people do that still to this day in the deep dark part of the Yukon winter. Um, once they cooled off, they would have to be warmed up before they would start. And often this was done by crawling underneath the vehicle to place a lit tiger torch beneath it, warming up the oil pan and engine, and engine to enable the restarting. As I mentioned briefly previously, the Alcan was built by 11,000 soldiers in the US Army Corps of Engineers. Three regiments or about one third of the soldiers were African-Americans segregated because of Jim Rowe Pro ideals. They had poorer equipment and supplies than their fellow soldiers, though all black regiments completed their road construction on schedule. Award-winning Canadian author Lawrence Hill is currently working on a book about the black soldiers on the Canal project. Six years after that initial year, 1942, so 1948, President Harry Truman ordered the army desegregated. Many historians cite the Alcan experience as helping make that possible. The US Federal Highway Administration, as I understand it, calls the Alcan the road to civil rights. This is a CMP made in Canada in a place called Oshawa, as I understand. The CMPs or Canadian Military Pattern Vehicles were resilient and reliable workhorses. Much like their soldier counterparts, CMPs were considered one of Canada's most vital contributions to the Allied victory. The manufacture of CMPs in Canada began in 1939 and by 1945, Canada had produced over 410,000 of them. They were produced by rivals Ford and GM. Take a minute there. This has been called the greatest automotive rivalry of all time. Amazingly, the two companies worked together for the war effort, uniting their design teams to produce a standardized vehicle suitable for mass production. Although made in Canada, CMPs featured a right-hand drive, which complied with standard British regulations of the time and additionally, it prepared military personnel for the European division of the war. CMPs also featured a basic chassis and a cab to which a variety of body types could be fitted. The motor is mounted in the front center of the truck, making it easily accessible for repairs and maintenance through an interior cowling. This CMP was used by the Canadian military in post-war maintenance of the Alaska Highway. Up until 20 years ago, it was still being used, skidding logs out of the bush, Originally a dump truck, this CMP was modified to a flat deck. Andy Hooper's truck. This CMP is the most famous truck in the Yukon, owned by that fellow right there, Andy Hooper. Andy arrived in the Yukon in 1942 to run the machine shop during the construction of the Alaska Highway. After the project was finished, he stayed and made his living as a mechanic and a building mover. You can see that he's attached a gin pole to, um, to the front of the CMP there. He adopted three children and he became a beloved figure in the Yukon community. Clinkett, Northern Tachoni, and Norwegian artist and performer, Sharon Shorty, um, those two groups, Clinkett, Northern Tachoni, those are both Yukon First Nations groups. Um, remembers, so Sharon Shorty, remembers the Indian agent telling her mother that she needed to move to the new area that was designated for First Nations people and that she would be provided a new house and her current house would be knocked down the next morning. She called Andy Hooper and between the time of the conversation with that agent and when the bulldozer 
arrived the next day, it didn't have a job to do. This CMP and Andy had done their magic and that house had vanished. These four vehicles, the Chev, the Ford, the two CMPs worked side by side with all kinds of heavy World War II vehicles. Jeeps by Ford and Willys, Dodge half ton four by fours, Chev one and a half ton four by fours, Studebaker six by sixes, GMC six by sixes, GMC air compressor trucks, Diamond T six by sixes, White six ton six by six heavy trucks, International Harvesters, Auto Car four by four, FWD four by four, 900 tractors, almost 400 graders, almost 200 shovels. They made 133 bridges and more than 8,000 culverts. On July 9th and 10th, 1942, a colossal rainstorm washed away 24 bridges, along with countless culverts and cubic yards of fill. But the soldiers and contractors got to it and built them all again. This route was completed to the extent that it was passable by heavy trucks when frozen on November 20th, 1942 with a ceremony at Soldier Summit in Kiwani Park. It was passed to the Public Roads Administration in 1943, and then to the Canadian Department of National Defense and remained a military road until 1948, whereupon it opened to civilian traffic. This is Bill Labarge and his dogs bringing freshly caught salmon into Whitehorse in the 1920s. And there was a huge influx of newcomers with the building of the Alaska Highway, who both brought and signaled change. Most came for the construction and left a vastly changed territory. A few stayed and were adopted by the Yukon, like Andy Hooper. One thing is clear, the highway changed everything. The route became an easy access to the resources of the North, and it changed the direction of the travel, of travel to the metropoles or the cities of the South, or outside. So that you know, in the Yukon, we refer to everything that is not the Yukon as outside, whether that's Ontario or Idaho or BC or Australia. It's all the Yukon or outside. With the completion of the Alaska Highway, no longer were the sea and river systems the path to the outside. The Alaska Highway became the new Yukon Main Street, connecting Canada to Alaska and the South in a way that hadn't existed prior. One of the horrible changes is that the highway brought epidemics and disease. Illness had been mostly avoided by Yukon First Nations people outside of the Klondike Travel Corridor. However, the arrival of the Alaska Highway brought in waves of illnesses and many people, particularly elders and young children, were lost. In 1942, the mortality rate among Yukon First Nations infants less than a year old was a staggering 47%. Ken Coates recently noted in a Globe and Mail article that after the Second World War, in a surge of social engineering, successive Canadian governments concluded the more intervention was the solution to Indigenous living conditions. Forced relocations, reserve housing that was substandard from the start, intrusive education, bureaucratic oversight, and targeted federal programs, among other initiatives, gave the state enormous authority over Indigenous lives. The Alaska Highway, allowed access by the federal government and their social programs. And residential schools became a stark reality for all Yukon First Nations people, with families torn apart, parents not able to teach their children family and traditional knowledge, and children growing up not knowing what it's like to be in a family. This social and cultural loss is a direct effect of the Alaska Highway, and its tremors continue to wreak havoc on our Northern society today. There is a tangible resentment in the Yukon regarding the Alaska Highway and these continuing aftershocks. On September 29th, 2022, only two weeks ago, the Canadian Museums Association released their Move to Action report. This has been developed out of working with a vast number of stakeholders and out of the call to action 67 from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and calls on us to integrate reconciliation into all we do. Its preface, for some, the standards described in this report may seem aspirational, severe, or overwhelming. These museum standards have been set with the understanding that achieving these will take time, respect, and reciprocity. 
allow time to process and consider how to enact these standards, prioritize and respect Indigenous perspective and knowledge, know that this is the work of many, look to others to support this work and be moved to action. It is clear to me, my job is to take tidy stories and make them a little more complicated, nuanced, challenging, and human. Going back to the tall tale postcards, in September of 2021 at the museum, I was reviewing a large collection related to the Alaska Highway in preparation for exhibition and program work for 2022. This year, the 80th year of the Alaska Highway. This collection was donated by the Cubic family, formerly of Watson Lake Yukon. Within the midst of photographs and postcards, I came across a series of tall tale postcards. Among them, this black and white image of four men sitting astride an absolutely enormous bike with three other enormous fish scattered around the frame. Having a wonderful time at Watson Lake Yukon. It is inscribed with a nine and copyright Canada 1943 by Canadian Postcard Company, Toronto. Well, I sat back and gazed at the image. So many questions began to surface. The card is dated 1943. This is odd because the highway wasn't open to civilian traffic until 1948. So who was making and sending these? Who was receiving them? What was the relationship between the Yukon and the Yukon as presented? It is easy to see why tall tale postcards were popular. They were and are used all over the place. Giant cobs of corn on train cars from Nebraska, giant potatoes from Idaho, etc. Here's the same card. I'll just flip back and forth here. Certainly today, they give us a chuckle, perhaps even more so with this set today because of the deliciously clumsy photo manipulation that helps illustrate the splashing and movement. You can see how they've scratched up the negative. They give us a moment of pause, however, to question what is a tall tale? In a tall tale, the narrator definitely does not believe it to be true. Though perhaps they wish the audience to believe it, at least for a while. Tall tale postcards appeared with the disappearance of the frontier as people sought to place themselves into frontier narratives. Rural communities primarily used them to forge an identity as places of abundance to encourage settlement and growth and vegetables, fruit, and fish were commonly used. In the area struggling with the over-harvested Alaska Highway Corridor, the postcards chosen by Watson Lake or its merchants and businesses express the idea of the limitless good, and they portray the idea of the unlimited natural resources of North America. The heavy involvement of Canada's North in World War II increased the speed of change and the access to resources. An appearance of clear title or of land unclaimed by others was promoted on a personal and a national level. The consequence to the people of the Yukon, as mentioned previously, was that of immense change and oftentimes rude and dangerous intrusions into family life. Those newcomers were involved in the frontier becoming home process, which involves an insider and an outsider. The insider is in the position of opening the door or sending the card and inviting the outsider into both the region and the joke. These humorous exaggerations served that purpose and they did it well because they housed ludicrous images that rested on truth. It is true, there are big fish in the North Country. The question is, how big is big? This is a true picture. Truth and tall tale intermingle in the Yukon. Were any of these cards used in the Yukon before the Alaska Highway was open to civilians? We can suppose this is unlikely and that the date printed on some of the cards as 1943 refers to the initial darkroom manipulation and not to the use of these cards at any particular time. Definitive use can only be confirmed by a postal stamp, which handily reveals not only the date, but location, waypoints, destination. Yukon postcard collector, or as I've learned, um, Deltiologist David Bouquet holds several tall tale postcards in his collection, and I was pleased to find one of his postcards had been mailed and held a legible postmark. It was marked September 8, 1948, from Watson Lake, Yukon, to Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Oh. 
so sorry we did not get to see you we were delayed 13 hours just made connections joyce and family fine having a wonderful time we will be leaving for home soon the alaska highway was open for civilian traffic in february of 1948 However, the postcard text refers to connections and makes no mention of road conditions nor driving endurance, which likely means this was not sent by road travelers, maybe bus travelers, maybe air travelers. It does remain the only mailed Watson Lake Yukon tall tale postcard that we have found. With the opening of the Alaska Highway to civilians after 1948, a surge of tourists came to make the journey. Winding in and winding out leaves my mind in serious doubt as to whether the lout that built this road was going to hell or coming out. As an aside, there were Alaska Highway travelers prior to the road being open to civilians, though they needed a military permit. In 1943, there was a Mrs. Baskin, a hitchhiking writer, who lately, later wrote the 1946 book, Hitchhiking the Alaska Highway. And there was a botanical <clears throat> and geological expedition from Harvard University. His diaries turned into the book, Alaska Highway Adventure. Bus service on the Alaska Highway began as early as June, 1943. Although it wasn't open yet to civilian traffic, Western Canadian Greyhound was contracted to transport troops and civilian workers into the Yukon and Alaska. By 1944, the U.S. Army was running its own bus service with five vehicles of their massive fleet. However, in September of 45, with the war just won, bus service was at somewhat of a crossroads. Fortunately, an agreement was made with both U.S. and Canadian governments to allow for a scheduled bus service along the Alaska Highway. The British Yukon Navigation Company which was a subsidiary of the White Pass and Yukon route, seized the opportunity. On October 1st, 1945, they established a twice-weekly service from Dawson Creek, BC to Whitehorse, Yukon. BYN, British Yukon Navigation, provided bus service until 1965 when it sold the operation to Canadian coachways. We hold several highway maintenance vehicles in our collection. They all worked a career on the highway, and when retired, they worked another career in the Yukon bush on gold mines, or like Andy's truck, moving buildings. FWD manufactured 24,000 military vehicles during the war. Load capacity ranged from 2.5 to 15 tons for hauling cargo, and they did all kinds of stuff, recovering tanks, disposing of bombs, building pontoon bridges, plowing snow off airfields. As Ken Coates, Alaska Highway historian, noted, the construction of the Alaska Highway broke dozens of engineering conventions and traditions. The Slean construction phase has traditionally been ignored in highway lore. The truth, without detracting from the Army's vital contribution, is that the American Public Roads Administration, and later the Canadian Department of National Defense, and then the Yukon Department of Public Works, and now the Yukon government highways and public works and its civilian contractors and workers were equally responsible for construction and maintenance. The Lorraine crane was used to build and maintain bridges on both the Alaska highway and the Campbell highway. It has a clam bucket as one of its accessories. And in the spring melt when trees would float down and pile up against the bridge pilings, Lorraine would be brought in and would clam them out, grab them, and move them aside. In the early days of highway maintenance, food shortages were not uncommon. And one worker recounted that they lived on spam for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. One time, when supplies finally came, they brought several cases of mustard pickles. You can see why the soldiers might be inclined to go hunting and fishing. And it wasn't not allowed either. To this day, we are dependent on the Alaska Highway for everything. The only other road to the Yukon is the Stuart Cassiar Highway. This summer, a beaver dam broke about 100 kilometers north of the beautiful Liard Hot Springs and took out the Alaska Highway for about three days. You can see it on this slide. When the Yukon was cut off from its supply chain, it took only about a day for the fresh produce that comes from outside to disappear. 
personally, I was quite pleased because in recent years, the amount of produce being grown in the Yukon seems to have increased substantially. However, the Yukon is still almost wholly reliant on the Alaska Highway for supplies, and even a short severing of the corridor creates problems and panic. You can see no salads when the Alaska Highway is broken. In its early years, the Rio company was one of the top four automobile manufacturers in the US. The depression and major competition from Ford and GM saw Rio abandon the manufacture of automobiles to concentrate on trucks by 1936. The increase of truck production for the war effort during World War II enabled the Rio company to retain a profit margin. But soon the company became unstable. And by 1957, it became a subsidiary of the White Motor Company. This 1949 Rio Gold Comet originally belonged to local businessmen at Jacobs. In addition to owning and operating a welding and machine shop and service station, Jacobs was also a former mayor of Whitehorse from 1962 to 65. The Rio served Jacobs well. It hauled steel from as far away as Edmonton and fuel from the port town of Haynes, Alaska. Its most recent owner and a true Yukon entrepreneur, Ron Hallway, had admired the truck for years. He paid $1 for it and rescued it from the scrap. He salvaged and traded original and unconventional parts, and he worked tirelessly with the aid of his grandsons to restore the Rio to its present condition. Like the Rio company, White Motor Company ended car production after World War I to focus exclusively on trucks. The company soon sold 10% of all trucks made in the US, Although White produced all size of trucks from light delivery to semi, the decision was made after World War II to produce only large trucks. White acquired several truck manufacturing companies during this time, including Rio in 1957. There was a time that the Yukon was full of Austins. And in fact, the Yukon Transportation Museum has quite an excellent collection of Austin parts and Austin's too, really. You, um, you can see with this Austin, it has a left-hand drive. It was manufactured specifically for export as the production and export of Austin's were vital to England's post-war post economy. England's war debt from the Lend-Lease program, it was massive. And rationing, which was introduced in 1940, was not completely eradicated until 1954. In February, 1948, Austin claimed its export earnings were the equivalent of 115 British pounds per. So, using the food rationing system, they said that the effort of each Austin employee was enough to feed 187 of their fellow countrymen for a week. This A40 is a pleasant little pickup truck, but it was, though. Mm, but though it was admirably suited for shorter trips of its home country of England, it was less compatible with vast distances of North America. Many of these 1950s era Austins had become derelict by the mid nineties in the Yukon and a crushing machine was brought up to manage the overflowing vehicle salvage yards. Giant piles of Austins were crushed and sent out as scrap, except this one. The museum is turning this into, it will be our, um, Errand mobile, Canada Day parade, and things like that. Historically, the highway was famous for being hard on vehicles. These days, there are less rough patches. However, this just leaves you more surprised when a frost heave suddenly leaps you into the air. In 1959, Canada clamped down on unprepared travelers, as described in the following news report. Canadian officials are acting to prevent the scenic Alaska highway from taking the appearance of a vast junk heap. Too many Alaska or bust adventurers who start out in old jalopies with little ready cash are going bust in Canadian territory. While US authorities were responsible for the highway rescue of their bankrupt countrymen, Canadians sometimes must grub stake the would-be pioneers. Derelict autos that break down along the rugged route often are abandoned on the spot. To make sure that Alaska bound US drivers reach their destination, immigration officials were suddenly requiring a kind of, they called it pioneer insurance. Before Americans were allowed to set out for Fairbanks over the Cross Canada Highway, 
they must show that they have enough cash to meet emergencies. The Canadian minimum required was $250 for a car and driver, $100 for additional passengers, and a valid credit card. Some of the marooned Americans have been U.S. Air Force personnel heading for Alaskan bases. As a result, the Alaskan Air Command has joined forces with Canadians in an attempt to keep the traffic moving. Did you hear that credit card? That struck me as weird for that time. So I had to look. Uh, sure enough, Diners Club had started in 1950 and American Express had started in 1958. The first year of the American Express cards were cardboard. In 1959, they were plastic. What I wonder, maybe one of you know, does anyone know more about the use of credit cards in remote places in these early days? I'd love to learn more about how this worked. I honestly cannot imagine it being anything other than an amazing exercise in trust and patience and paperwork. Meet St. Agnes. The Canadian Sunday School Mission was founded in 1920 by Miss Eva Hassel. She devised, she devised a plan to provide Anglican Sunday School services to the children of scattered and isolated communities in Canada's Western provinces. She proposed that a motor van would be the most efficient way to carry out the mission. The vanners, as they were affectionately known, were usually British women who typically served four months at a time. Each van required two staff, one trained in religious education and the other serving as the driver and mechanic. The vans were equipped with box beds and camping gear and became the vanners home for the summer. They also provided minimal storage necessary for transport of food and clothing and educational materials. The vans were built to Miss Hassel's specifications and were comprised of a Ford chassis, an engine with a custom built van body. The body was built of wood with the exterior covered by metal. Thus, if the powertrain wore out, the body could be transferred to a new chassis. In 1949, Eva Hassel and Iris Sale included the Alaska Highway and the long established mission services. For many years, the banners were a familiar sight each summer, traveling 1200 miles or 1931 kilometers of the Alaska Highway to teach Sunday school to the women and children living in the isolated road camps and lodges of the Yukon and Northern BC. This van is the second van that was named St. Agnes. It was commissioned in 1957 and was in operation until the early 70s. The police car. Known, it, it's, do you know what? It's only recently that my car is newer than this car. I used to always own cars older than this one. <laughs> um, known in 1894 as the Northwest Mounted Police, the Mounties arrived in the Yukon before the Klondike Gold Rush to establish sovereignty and maintain law and order. At that time, horses were not practical for the Yukon's climate and rugged terrain. The Mounties relied on snowshoes, dog sleds, and boats for transport in these years. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police, RCMP, first used vehicles to patrol the Manitoba-USA border in 1916. These vehicles were McLaughlin Buicks, manufactured in Ontario which I think actually the Canadian Automotive Museum has one of them. By 1920, the force had added 10 Rio trucks and 15 motorcycles to their motor fleet. This 1992 Chevrolet Caprice Classic was part of the fleet of the RCMP's Whitehorse Detachment. By 1995, the centennial anniversary of the RCMP, the force was phasing out the blue paint scheme in favor of the white one currently in use. The distances patrolled by the RCMP in the Yukon are immense. And about 20 years ago, a Teslin police officer created the Plywood Yukon Police Car. There are now several of these around the territory in Haines Junction and Destruction Bay. Some joker quipped, they said we needed a multi-dimensional approach to policing. I said more than one dimension ain't in the quarterly budget. <laughs> because I am a rather fast driver, these plywood police cars always give me a bit of a start and a smile. 
The Yukon Transportation Museum acquires, preserves, studies the history and material culture of Yukon's transportation modes and interprets this history in an educational manner for all Yukoners and visitors alike. The beauty of this statement is its open-endedness and its easy jump into the simple and nebulous question, what is transportation? Over the years, the museum has adopted the answer to be transportation is the movement of people, their possessions, and their ideas across the landscape. This answer has encouraged the museum to view transportation through the motivations of people and with the shifting and dynamic relationships between society, technology, and values. We understand the Alaska Highway as an incredibly complicated historical figure and as a changer of Yukon lives. We hold a number of Alaska Highway construction equipment pieces and all continued their existence in the Yukon beyond their first career. And we're remade through ingenuity and self-sufficiency into exactly what was needed for whatever task was at hand, one of a kind Yukon vehicles. Andy Hooper and Andy Hooper's truck both came to the Yukon for highway construction, but were changed forever by the Yukon, the place they served and loved and lived out their hardworking lives in. In 2009, Yukon historian David Newfeld was driving along the Alaska Highway on his way to a meeting. Later, he wrote within his blog post, how is it that our culture can lay down thousands of tons of crushed rock and oil impregnated asphalt in the midst of the Yukon forest so that I can do this? Is this the most important thing we could do with all these resources? Smooth ride so my coffee won't spill? This is a great question. In the Yukon, two ideas arrived with the completion of the Alaska Highway. First, the North needed help to catch up with the rest of Canada. And second, as summed up by Gordon Robertson, the Deputy Minister of Northern Affairs and Natural Resources in 1960, we own the North, it belongs to us. Canadians, for this reason, must look to the North to see what it is good for, to see how to use it. As our country moves towards more reciprocal modes of thinking, we can question our relationship with the Alaska Highway. What can it teach us? What might I envision as its future within all the complexity? The Alaska Highway's construction and its legacy is a significant and enduring creation in the Yukon's history. Today, the Alaska Highway is both an economic and social conduit and a home for both a progress and a disruption narrative. The Alaska Highway is the strongest symbol of colonialism in Yukon. I wanna thank you for following the story with me through some of the Yukon Transportation Museum's vehicles and seeing which narratives grow, shrink, shift over time, and we can scrutinize which narratives are missing or poorly translated and allow them to regain their spaces. This 80th anniversary is an opportunity to continue building healthier relationships within our communities, in particular, as we move closer to the 100th anniversary of the Alcan. Despite the power imbalance that grew over time, the First Nations of the Yukon with wit, tenacity and resilience forwarded their principles through for example, the seminal 1973 document, Together Today, for Our Children Tomorrow. Armed with their determination, courage, and this historic document, they met with Pierre Trudeau and were able to convince him to begin a negotiation process for a modern day treaty, the first in Canada. Johnny Johns was a respected Carcross Dagish First Nation citizen and a famous hunting guide. He guided surveyors during the building of the Alaska Highway. And then he later worked with the CYI, the Council for Yukon First Nations, for many years in the early land claims process. Currently, 11 of the 14 Yukon First Nations have self-government agreements. On this 80th anniversary of the building of the gravel magnet, let's look at the Alcan in the eye with all honesty. Keep an eye out for the tall tales. What are the harms and how can we work on the relationships to bring the Alaska Highway into our communities and hearts with the goal of improving our relationships with the Alcan in meaningful and authentic ways for future generations. With the 100th anniversary only 20 years away, we may as well start right now. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. That, uh, Jenna, that was just a, a fantastic talk. I, I wrote down several notes on various 
Canadian car topics I want to I want to learn more about just just from that presentation. Um, so we have about 15 minutes uh, until eight o'clock. Um, I know I have lots of questions, but uh, if anyone wants to jump into the Q&A at the bottom um, about the Alaska Highway, about the Yukon Transportation Museum. I know I'm looking at our, our list of, of attendees and I know there's a, a few people who aren't too shy. So um, go ahead. I see people are entering questions. Um, Jana, I'll just I'll just start off. Well, what to you? What's the most interesting fact that you've run across, or or you know, what's what's your you know, when people ask you about the Alaska Highway, what's what's your favorite thing that comes to mind about it, or 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 topic that you you love to to talk about at the the transportation museum? One thing I like to appreciate is um, this road building and the relationship with permafrost and how people did such a steep curve of learning when they were building this highway. There's an area north of Beaver Creek, which is um, the northern end of the Alaska Highway right before it goes into Alaska. And there's an area there, I think it's about 10 or 20 kilometers, where they called it the Grand Canyon of the Alcan because um, some permafrost was scraped off and uh, and the quote from the military general boss colonel guy was um, the Yukon sunshine can make more mud than the I don't know the Amazon monsoon season or something like that. Um, and it, it was the Grand Canyon of the Alaska Highway vehicles would disappear into the mud, they would. I guess they would become part of the road um, and there was a time when it was completely impassable and. Uh, and then, well, cold solves that issue and they were able to pull some fill in, but still for, for quite a while, um, it was only possible to get through there by trucks being pulled with cats. Great. Um, so we have, uh, Patrick has a question about taking a bus to the Yukon still. Is there still, service to the Yukon uh, via any bus providers out, out there? This is not the definitive answer. Uh, I, Greyhound has finished doing their service to the Yukon. There used to be a Greyhound station in town, but I think that, and maybe it's closed for all of Canada, but I think it closed about 10 years ago. Um, there certainly is lots of tour buses. People seem to enjoy touring by bus and uh, and those are possible. Often they're aligned with the cruise ships, but as for one of the kind of basic transportation busing, um, I, yeah, that doesn't seem that possible, which may well be because um, flight seems to be a preferred option these days with the, you know, the prices. But um, yeah, I haven't seen any Greyhound type buses. But many, like Westmark buses, or they're sort of tour ship buses that okay. travel around, check out all these things. So Clark is wondering uh, that some of the many of the vehicles pictured didn't have any headlights. Uh, were they removed, or did they just not exist? Did people only work in the daylight in the Yukon? I mean, you get the whole winter off, I guess. Uh, is that? What is there kind of a relationship between the Yukon and that that feature? Um, all the ones that are restored have headlights. Um, in the summer, it is light all the time, so you wouldn't need them. Um, however, it's not that they were removed. Uh, the The Yukon and the roads are pretty hard on headlights and wind windscreens, windshields, so many of the vehicles that come to the museum, if we choose to keep them in the condition that we received them in, which is sometimes the decision, then um, yeah, then they're missing, they're missing parts and they're damaged, that's for sure. That's part of their, their scars and scabs of their long, hard work in life. Great. Yeah, I noticed, uh, I, I love the rough and tumble condition of a lot of the, the vehicle, the authentic uh, <laughs> 
ruggedness. We have, we have a number of uh, Yukon license plates in our uh, our collection, and they're all in really rough shape from from the lives they've lived. So I I, I understand that. Uh, that is very so... interesting. I would love to see some of your license plates. We have a full collection from 1914 to 2014 of Yukon license plates. And okay. it is very fascinating how they've changed over time. It would be cool to see yours. Well, another another project to work on. So yeah, uh, I will make a note of that as well. Um, so Ron has a question about your the Austin A40 pickups. Um, did you mention how many uh, had were were in the Yukon? So could you could you talk a little bit more about the the Austin relationship? So why 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 did so many end up in in the Yukon? You know, I'm not an Austin Yukon Austin expert. Um, why did they end up in the Yukon? There was a dealership here, and so it was one of the vehicles that was being sold here. Um, they, and I'd like to look more into it because they must have been, um, maybe it was a, I don't know if it would have been a patriotic choice to buy them or maybe they were inexpensive. Those things I'm not too sure about. And how many were here, I'm not really sure about. I, I have only seen the piles of them leaving you know the smashed up mm. piles of them that's the it seems extremely striking okay. that there was this mass adoption and then um yeah it turned out it didn't work well, i think well. i think we're gonna dig into our archives and see if we can find some stats on that as well i'm not sure i'm, I'm curious to know when when stats on the yukon start start being published uh, in terms of car mm. usage and so forth so we will We'll have to do a part two on this uh, in the future. Um, and, and speaking of that, uh, Robert uh, is, is, is curious uh, a little bit more about sort of the the rise of car culture in, in the Yukon. Um, and Ooh, when, that when, is when... a great question. That is very awesome. That is an awesome question. Um, of the capital of the Yukon, in the like at the turn of the century was Dawson City. Now it's Whitehorse. That changed in the 1950s with the coming of the Alaska Highway. The capital moved here. Prior to that, it was Dawson City. Dawson City is famous for the Klondike Gold Rush, and um, Dawson City at its height, which was around 1900s, was the they like, what did they call it? The Paris of the North or something? It had electricity before any like almost anywhere else in North America. Um, I think it was the first place with electricity north of San Francisco and west of Chicago, something like that. Um, we got all the like the best movies first and all the height of fashion. Everything was available in Dawson City anyways, including vehicles. Um, and uh, there's a very good museum in Dawson City called the Dawson City Museum and they um, have, I worked with them a little bit to see if I could find an electric car in Dawson City because I think that would have been um, commonsensical. They did have electricity there. They were they were um, creating it locally, and doesn't that make more sense than shipping gasoline from wherever the supply chain was coming from? Anyways, uh, so in Dawson City there was quite a few vehicles. There's one. Called, there was that around the world race that happened in 1906, I think, that passed through Dawson City. It's a famous car called the Zeus, which ended up in Dawson City after that race. Um, one of the things that happened in the 20s and 30s is the um, indigenous people were were doing lots of trapping and trap like fur prices were very high. So car culture was adopted on a fairly big scale by indigenous people. There was a fellow in Teslin in the 1930s called George Johnson, 1926 maybe. I think he bought a 1926 Ford and got it shipped to Teslin, the little First Nations community on a steamer. Um, and he used it in the summer to um, drive people around on a road that he cut that later became part of the Alaska Highway 
incidentally. In the winter, he painted it white and drove it around on the lake and used it to hunt wolves. Oh, wow. Making more notes on interesting stories. Um, yeah. <laughs> So uh, Jason's asking a question that I, I absolutely know that Demeric has probably asked you already because we're working on an exhibit about this. Um, but do we know the first automobile that was used in the Yukon? Um, yes, we do. And there's a picture of it and a little write up about it. And I don't remember what it was. Um, there's a picture of it heading through Atlin, BC, and heading on its way to Dawson City. And that's something that, um, that we can find out and get the answer back off the top of my head. I can't remember. Okay. Well, it we might are... have been like 1899 or something like that. It was right at the height of the Klondike Gold Rush Dawson City excitement. Yeah. So for the future, not to give away our future exhibits, but uh, we are researching the, the first cars uh, across Canada and Canadian communities. So um, we'll, well, you'll have to get that, that later once we get all the answers. Uh, so it looks like we just have a couple minutes left. Uh, if anyone has any last questions, uh, Clark has uh, one question about a, a type of car that wasn't covered, uh, which would be the Dodge Power Wagons, um, which... I believe were were popular with the, the the military and so forth uh during that period do you have any power wagons they're they're quite pop quite popular with collectors these days yeah we do not yeah we don't have one of those um but yeah that's right they're um they're a frequent flyer in the pictures aren't they and uh mm -hmm. i don't know how many of them were used on the highway but i suspect there was quite a few okay yeah, it looks, I mean, the, the range of, of vehicles in terms of manufacturer, it seems like every, every big truck manufacturer of the 1930s and 40s was, was sending trucks up there. So it was quite a, quite a breadth of, of Canadian and American vehicles and, and British vehicles. Uh, I think that for me, that's what surprised me about this talk is, is the sheer breadth of, of variety that existed um in such a what you know we would down here in ontario think of as a remote part of the country obviously uh not to people mm -hmm. in the yukon um but uh for us that are are southern ontario centered uh it seems like a long way to to ship all those big trucks so uh quite a yeah quite i guess a massive feat. the thing alex is many of them made a one-way trip because it was very expensive to ship them out once they broke or were no longer needed. So um, hopefully some of the people from this talk would come up to visit because there are many piles of these abandoned vehicles from World War II. Places like up the North Canal is quite striking and fascinating. And um, it's just like the day they were left there, people tend not to bother them. And it's, oh, wow. yeah, it's, it's quite poignant to spend time with these and carcasses, I guess, of a previous age. Yeah. Well, thank you so much.